Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ruth Shelley, president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. As you know, this year's theme for Rotary International is Rotary Opens Opportunities. Yes, Rotary opens opportunities to find solutions for today's challenges. Healing from the pandemic, recovery from the economic downturn, and peace building as we seek racial justice. But this week, we open a new door to discovering the geology of the Oregon coast with our own favorite Rotarian speaker, Dr. Scott Burns. But first, let's welcome Rotarian Ken Franson for our reflection. Ken? Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. I was talking the other day with a good friend of mine, Kirk. He had just bought a, a beautiful car, a GV80, which happened to be the same model that Tiger Woods was in when he got wrapped around it, uh, going around a curve uh, last week. So I thought I'd give Kirk a call and, and see what he thought about his car now. So he loved it. He just went on and on about how great it was and how it probably saved Tiger's life. And when our conversation was over, he said, remember, Ken, money cannot buy happiness, but it can buy cars, and that's close enough. So that got to me thinking about another friend of mine, my old friend, Ed Diener, who you may know as Dr. Happiness. Uh, Ed was one of the very first researchers to investigate the science of happiness. As a grad student, he told a supervising professor that he wanted to do his dissertation on a scientific study of happiness. The professor said, Ed, two things. First, you can't measure happiness, so it's impossible to study it. And number two, if you do, you will never get a teaching job for the rest of your life. So he came up with something else and waited until he got tenure, and then he started studying happiness. And what he found is there were a couple of common threads that virtually all people who uh, were happy, happy subject, uh, subjectively and uh, happy objectively, uh, a couple of common threads among them. Now, you might be wondering about money. Well, not so much. He found that there were incremental increases in happiness as people left poverty and reached middle class. But beyond that, Happiness increased very little, if at all. No, there were two things that were critical to happiness. Number one, people who are happy devote themselves to something greater than themselves. It might be religion, it might be spirituality, or a dedication to helping others in some way, but something bigger than themselves that consumes them. And number two, they have a strong network of social relationships. And that got me to thinking about Rotary and the motto that we have that I love and that drew me in, service above self. As Rotarians, we are devoted to serving others and to put them ahead of ourselves. And in so doing, we get to know each other and we get to deepen our relationships. There have been times in my life when I tried to achieve happiness by doing things or acquiring things that I thought would make me happy. Those were not the happiest times of my life. There have been other times when I dove in with all of my time and energy to do something significant. For example, the busiest year of my life was when I was president of a small rotary club in Central California, and we took on a project to build a boys and girls club in our town. As if that was not enough, we also took primary responsibility for building a home for a needy family. The club had only 55 members. I have never worked so hard, nor with such purpose, yet it was without question one of the happiest years of my life, and that was not a coincidence. So today, I want to celebrate Rotary and the opportunities it gives us for service and fellowship and for the happiness that that gives. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Ken. That powerful combination of service and fellowship is what we're all about. And if you'd like to volunteer to give the reflection, as Ken just did, Siobhan has put the link in the chat, or you can email her directly. It's one way of continuing to be happy. 
Now I'd ask that all Rotarians who have invited a guest to raise their real or virtual hand and Maria will call on you to unmute yourselves and introduce them. Or if you're a visiting Rotarian who came on your own, please raise your hand and introduce yourself or let us know of your presence through the chat box. Maria, do we have any guests today? We do, President Ruth. We have a repeat guest, uh, Ms. Kirsten Shank. Kirsten, would you mind unmuting yourself and saying a quick hello? Yes, I can do that. My space bar is not working today, but hello. Thank you so much for having me. This is my third time visiting and y'all are wonderful and um, just so excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And that's all we have, Ruth, although we have some amazing Rotarians I haven't seen in a while. So thank you, everyone, for being here. That's terrific. And uh, you'll see my mother and my husband later on as they join us for Scott's presentation. But first, it's March. Happy March. I'd like to extend a happy birthday to everyone with birthdays during this month. We alternate each week with birthdays and anniversaries and take a look at all of these wonderful March birthday babies. And please reach out and give them a special greeting, especially since it's harder and harder for us to enjoy each other's company in person. Happy birthday to all of you spring babies. And now I'd like to make note that the Rotary Club of Portland office moved last week to central office just down Morrison Street from our former space. The new address will be updated on our website and special thanks to Corinne and Siobhan for leading the move after five years in our old space. You can only imagine, or maybe you can, how much stuff accumulates in five years. This was truly a team effort. And I want to thank Nihada Wida and our dear Karen Stefanov for hauling items to Goodwill Leslie Brunker for taking a carload of electronics to Free Geek, Dick Winger, Doug Moshofsky, and Del Delany Delamont for wrapping up Toastmaster items, Phil Levison for picking up some large Peace Builders things, and Steve Watts for re recommending Central Office as our new space in the first place, which will save us considerable amount in rent. Again, thank you all, and we all look forward to seeing the new space. We need to have a housewarming at some point. Now, please welcome Rotarian Kurt Martik to tell you about the March Madness fundraiser. Kurt? Good afternoon, Rotarians. For those of you that missed last week's announcement, I'm here to let you all know that we're going to be doing a March Mad Rotary March Madness 50-50 raffle. You can see the details being pulled up here on the screen. Buy-in will be $20. It can be paid on the Rotary website, which is now live. The group will be online. It's not online yet, as we're not quite to the uh, tournament time, but as soon as that comes up in about 10 days or so, I will be sending a link out. Uh, we'll have it on this folks' email, and we'll also provide it in the Tuesday meeting before the tournament starts on March 18th. And now you may be thinking to yourself, I don't follow college basketball that much. You wouldn't know who to pick. But if you just said that, then you are actually the exact person that should fill out a bracket because you're most likely to win. Filling out a March, Mad March Madness bracket is much more about uniforms and funny mascot as it is about basketball. So if you're someone in there is lurking and hasn't done one in a long time, just do it, just give it a shot. You're gonna raise money for the club and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So uh, it was, I think that should cover it all. If um, there's any questions, you can, uh, I'll put my email in the chat. I'm gonna have to probably bounce out a little bit early, but you can just contact me via email. And I thank you very much. Ruth, back to you. Thank you, Kurt, for organizing this. So it should be a lot of fun and it's a great fun way to support the club. Now we're going to disappear and enter our virtual table talk. As always, please introduce yourselves to the others in your group. And a minute or so, so before we need to come back to this main meeting, you'll get that visual heads up. And let me suggest a topic for your discussion. As we look forward to Scott's presentation, do you have a favorite coastal memory or a favorite place to visit on the Oregon coast? Here we go. We'll see you in a few minutes. And now on to our program. 
after Scott today is finished, if you'd like to ask him a question, Maria will be moderating the questions and answers through the chat box as usual. Now, please welcome a man who needs no introduction, Rotarian Dr. Scott Burns, former president of our club, retired professor of geology at Portland State University, and all around great guy. Scott, welcome. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you very much to the club. Um, our speaker didn't show up, and so the, yesterday they got in touch with me and said, Scott, can you fill in? And I was working on a talk that I'm giving tonight for OMSI on the Oregon coast, and, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And it's special for Ruth, mainly because she, now, she and Kevin now live on the coast. Uh, also, I wanted to dedicate this talk to Chick Urzurumlu, who was in our club. I found out yesterday that he had died of COVID this past fall. I knew that he had passed away. I didn't realize it was COVID. Uh, inspirational dean at uh, Portland State, active in our club, and it was wonderful. And I, a shout out also to Mike Pendergast, who was up in Anchorage. And they just had a 5.3 earthquake up there for geologists. That's kind of exciting type of stuff. And so wanted to do that. So I'm going to do a little share screen. And hopefully it will come up. And so, Ruth, can we see it? It said ready to go. All right. Let me just get this done. And so what we're going to do is talk about the dynamic geology of the Oregon coast. Uh, and I love going to the coast. And over the weekend, I was down at the coast pr putting together this talk. And so um, um, let's talk a little bit about the secrets of the Oregon coast and, and uh the geology that Mother Nature is shouting out to us as we go down to the uh, area. And this is Cape Kwanda, which I'll be talking about in a little while. All right, let's see. We can get to the next one. There we go. So I'm going to give you a very short background on the geology of Oregon. We're going to talk about the Wanda Fuca Plate off of the uh, edge of the coast that is affecting us all here. Uh, we have all the headlands on the northern Oregon coast and, and the what's the basic geology that is down there. And then we're going to talk about processes. Uh, landslides are a thing near and dear to my heart, and I'll show you a couple of those. But another thing, when you go down onto the beach and you look at the sand, if you go back uh, a week later, it's not going to be there. It's going to have moved up and down the beach. And this is something that people don't understand. I'm going to talk about Bay Ocean, the city that fell into the ocean. Uh, and then we'll talk about the origin of sea stacks and our most famous one in Oregon, haystack rock. Did you know that there is a second haystack rock too? Sand dunes and then uh, ending up with uh, earthquakes. Also, I wanted to mention radon. I forgot to put the slide in about it, but we use, um, um, I try and get everybody to test their house for radon. And we found out recently that a lot of houses on the coast also have radon. Uh, gas that naturally comes out of the ground, and we never thought it, it would be found at the coast. Uh, Oceanside is a place where many of the houses down there were high in radon. So if you have a beach house, we encourage you to test your house. It's cheap to test, cheap to mitigate. You can buy the kits at uh, any hardware store for that. So let's get in and talk a little bit about the beach. So we live on Cascadia. We have a plate that is being originated off of the coast. Uh, 200 miles off, there's a coast of volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean, creating a plate that is moving towards us. And then it, uh, going down into a big, deep trench called Cascadia Trench, and then going underneath us, melting and coming back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes from Mount Lassen down in California, all the way up to Mount Garibaldi up in, um, uh, up in British Columbia. Uh, and then there is another chain of volcanoes further on down south, that is creating the Gorda plate that is coming down in. That plate is even more active with big, big uh, earthquakes. We'll talk about that coming up in a second. So you have uh, the, uh, what, what, what happens when the Juan de Fuca plate and the Gorda plate go down underneath North America. It eventually melts, come back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes, creating the Cascade. It also uplifts all the sediments that were along the coast, creating the Coast Range. And we'll talk a little bit about that, too. 
So first of all, along the Oregon coast, the northern Oregon coast, there are a lot of habits. And it is mostly basalt. Where did that come from? Basalt is a volcanic type of rock, but uh, it uh, has come out of the ground where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together. That is where the Yellowstone hotspot used to be. Actually, it was down here. An arm went up where Oregon, Idaho, and Nevada come together. And then uh, that arm, uh, especially between 18 and 15 million years ago, created huge amounts of magma just oozing out of the ground, filled up all of eastern Washington, but a lot of it got into the Columbia River and went in the ancestral Columbia River, went into the ocean all the way from Newport all the way up to Willapa Bay. And so all of those headlands are all valleys that were filled up with basalt flows coming from eastern Oregon. Eventually, that hot spot shut down. It went back down here. North America came over it uh, and over the last... 10 million years, and where is it today? It is right underneath Yellowstone National Park, and it, it, uh, every 600,000 years, it creates a huge volcanic eruption, uh, a mega uh, a volcano that is found over there. But that, when it uh, erupted here, uh, was oozers, and it created most of the basalt. And so this is what it would look like for the three states come together. Magma coming up, just like in Hawaii, because it is, it, Hawaii is also a hot spot. And you can see all of the different uh, flows are, have come out and, and are found all the way down to the coast. Uh, to me, as an engineering geologist, it's just plain old black basalt. And this is what it looks like. One flow on top of another, on top of another. If you go to Multnomah Falls, you can see five different flows, one on top of another, on top of another. And here is Yaquinta Head, which is just outside of Newport. That's all basalt. Where did it come from? You can tell all your friends. It came all the way across the state of Oregon and uh, solidified here. You, you Quinta Head, Cascade Head, Cape Lookout, uh, Tillamook Head, all of those are all basalt flows that came from eastern Oregon. Uh, and then, and here is Hesita Head, Hesita Head, and it too is another one of these basalt flows that came all the way across. Uh, and then Tillamook Head Lighthouse out there just outside of Cannon Beach. It is part of one of these flows that came across, as is a stack rock, which I'll be talking about a little while later. The rest of the flow has kind of eroded away. Now, so if you go down to Cape Fowlweather, which is also on the coast, and you go to the gift shop, which is right here in the white, they'll say, oh, this is a crater of an old volcano. Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? But it is not. It is volcanic rock. It is basalt. But the crater it came out of was in eastern Oregon, where the three states come together. That is a landslide that created this area there, came all down in through there. And that's why it looks like a volcano, but it is not. And then uh, this is what most of the coast range looks like, kind of just boring. But it is really exciting. If you dig down in, the heart of it is all basalt. Uh, and it's a different basalt that came from eastern Oregon. And on top of it, it's all uplifted marine sediments, sandstones and shales primarily, that you find especially on the east side and the west side. We'll show you some of the ones that are on the coast uh, coming up, especially the Astoria Formation. The east side, you have all those great wineries that are built on the Willikensee soils, which are developed on the marine sediments that you have got. And that basalt center that is there is what we call Celestia. Uh, and it was the old hotspot that is now under Yellowstone that was off of the coast of Oregon, generating this huge amount of magma coming up and then solidifying and then hooking on to North America all, uh, all the way from the southern end of the coast range up uh, into the northern part of uh, the coast range. Um, all right. And then I want to just mention the rivers because there are made. So this is down south. This is the Rogue River. You also have the Umpqua River. You have uh, all of the rivers going up and down the Halem River, for instance, on the coast. But they are the source of all the sand. And so the weathering of the rocks that are found in the coast range uh, deliver through the rivers all of the sand to the beaches. So when you were with friends along the coast on the beach, ask them, where did that sand come from? Well, it came out of the coast range and the rivers replenished it. And then once it hits the beach, then it moves up and down 
uh, with time. And then uh, if you go down to Devil's Punch Bowl, which is just north of um, Newport, you can see some of the uplifted marine sediments, shales and sandstones that are there. Especially in the wintertime, you get really bursts of, of, of huge waves coming up like that. Or you go down to Cape Kowanda, Pacific City. Those are also um, uh, sedimentary type of rocks that are there. And Or you go down to Southern Oregon, uh, Cape Blanco. Uh, and Cape Blanco is the furthest west point in the lower 48 states. Uh, it is old uplifted marine sediments that have uh, been accreted onto Oregon. Uh, and it forms this beautiful, beautiful area. And not many people from go to it. And here you are down south, looking south on the beach, and then out on the right-hand side, you can see, see Cape Blanco that is there. Or it, it go uh, just outside of um, uh, um, the town, just north of there um, uh, on the Oregon coast, Coos Bay, uh, you have a state park, uh, which is just absolutely beautiful, uplifted marine sediments, and it's on the edge of an anticline that you have got there. So all along the Oregon coast, you have got landslides that are affecting the roads down there and houses. And I just want to mention four of them uh, today. My favorite one is on the southern Oregon co coast, and it's called the Huskanaden. It is over 100 square miles in size. It is gigantic. Everything in this photo is moving. And Highway 101 had a huge landslide just this past year on that. And the road that I am on at the very upper part, they never pave it because everything is moving. It's just a dirt road and they just bring a, um, a, um, a road grader in uh, yearly and, and go over it. Also, if you go down to Ecola State Park, uh, which is just north of Cannon Beach, that whole thing, everything you see here was a landslide that moved down in 1960. I still remember as a kid growing up here. The other end of uh, Cannon Beach down here, Silver Point down here, also major landslide uh, that is, has occurred in the past. Three houses went down in the 1980s. And then a famous one on the Southern Oregon coast shut down the uh, Highway 101 for about six months, Arizona in landslide. You can see the size of it uh, that went down all the way down onto the beach and they hit incredible engineering went into reopening that highway at a later period of time. And Ken Franson in our, our, our Rotary Club who gave the, um, the special moment at the beginning, uh, uh, spends a lot of time down in Newport. They've got a condo down there. And just in front of their house was a very famous landslide that is activated and stopped, activated and stuff called Jump Off Joe. And, and re more recently, because of all the big king tides and the storms and everything, uh, Ken got in touch with me and said, it looks like uh, Jump Off Joe has reactivated again. And so this is kind of the hot topic down there in Newport right now. So landslides, big deal along the coast. Another concept that I wanted to mention, I mentioned before, when you go down onto the beach, okay, um, you if this is the sand that you can see up here, every time a wave comes in, and if it's from in the wintertime, a lot of the waves are coming from the northwest, it will move the sand up onto the beach, and then gravity will pull it back down, and sand grain comes like that. Next wave comes in, goes down, and so that causes the sand to move down the beach, depending upon the direction of the waves that are coming in. In an El Nino year, it goes in the opposite direction, and the sand moves from the southwest to the north. Um, along the coast. And so what happens is that sand will continue moving. If you have a big bay, they, uh, what will happen is a spit will form and then that spit will go all the way across and that's what we call a bay, marth, uh, bay mouth bar. And then if it go, goes into a big bay, it forms a spit. And so along the coast, it tells you the dominant wind directions and the dominant flow of sand along the coast. It is never static. And then also, uh, there is, in the wintertime, movement of the sand from the beach offshore. Uh, and it will go into offshore bars. And then in the summertime, it comes back. So when you go to a beach in the wintertime, it'll be a very, very narrow, narrow beach. And in the uh, summertime, it'll be a very, very wide beach. So you have a movement up and down the coast by longshore drift, and then on and off in the summer and in the winter. 
So in Oregon, we have six major spits that go north and six major spits that go south. And I wanted to mention uh, Celeste Bay because the Salishan uh, is listed here. And this was developed, that whole resort, by John Gray, who was a very famous Rotarian in our club back in the early 1970s. Uh, and then here is a picture of the Salishan spit. You can see right here showing you the dominant movement of the sand is going to be in a northerly direction at that particular place there. Just up north of Lincoln City, you have Salmon River Spit, also going in a northerly direction. Or one of the most famous spits along the coast is in the Halem Spit. Here is Manzanita that is here, and all of this is sand. And, it, and especially during El Nino years, there is a major movement of sand from the south to the north because of the dominant winds coming from the central Pacific. And then what happens in the summertime, all that sand that moves north blows inland. And so Manzanita is all on sand dunes. They have a little golf course there, and I still, and they have the hardest time keeping it green in the summertime because you water it and all that sand just goes right through. Why? Because it's built on sand dunes. Uh, but Manzanita, one of the hot property areas, as Nihad will tell you, uh, along the Oregon coast, but it is on sand dunes and a sand spit. And here is Rockaway. There is a baymouth barrier that goes along. Look at all the houses that are uh, built on that. And then another one just further on south, Neatarts Bay at Cape Lookout, uh, and uh, also one of those major spits that we have along the Oregon coast. Now, when you are along the coast, you can tell uh, if you don't have a spit, the dominant direction of the local waves uh, and the, the longshore drift that you have got. We have a lot of jetties along the Oregon coast to allow people to go into the harbors. Uh, and then sometimes they will build, build, uh, people will build groins out into the water to uh, trap uh, sand that is moving up and down just to increase the size of the beach. Here is uh, in New Jersey, and you can see all the groins that have been built here, and you'll notice that they're building up on one side and eroding on the other side. That's telling us that the longshore drift is in a uh, uh, direction from the bottom of the slide to the top. Classic one in Ocean City, Maryland. Here are two jetties that are here. And look at the building up the beach here and a road over here showing you that the dominant direction of the longshore drift is from the bottom to the top. So we now understand those things. And here is Newport. And you'll notice here, here are the jetties that are here. Look at the beach on the south side, much bigger than the beach on the north side. So the dominant direction of the sand moving locally in that area is from the south to the north. And then we come down to Tillamook and the Tillamook Bay, and there is the North Jetty and the South Jetty. And, and back at the turn of the century, the whole spit that is right here was very, very large. Uh, and then the Army, and, and, and it, it led to the development of Bay Ocean. It was to be the Atlantic City of the Oregon coast. And I'm going to tell you the story of that, but keep, so here's the North Jetty, uh, which was built in 1914 through 17. And then the South Jetty wasn't built until sometime later. Look at the size of this today. So here is the Tillamook Spit. There is the Tillamook Bay and all the five rivers that are feeding into it. And that was the site of Bay Ocean. And in 1907, you would see ads like this in the Oregonian uh, uh, by the Potter Chapin Realty Company to buy lots that are down here. And they, uh, they, they started building this huge town down here. They built the first Olympic-sized natatorium on the beach to attract people to come down. They had visions of making a huge, gigantic um, uh, hotel like Atlantic City, New Jersey. They never got to that point. And eventually, uh, in the 1950s, the last house fell into the ocean. The whole thing eroded away and disappeared. Uh, and so just to give you the history of Bay Ocean, the city that fell into the ocean, very famous in Oregon history, 1906, Tom Potter bought 600 acres on that spit, paid $20,000, divided it into 14,000 lots, and in, he had sold 1,600 uh, 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 lots there. 1907, Rose Festival float, buy a lot. A lot of people did. And an official opening was 1912. 
1917. They built three hotels, many hundreds of houses, a school, a store, a bakery, a post office, a Texaco gas station, station, bowling alley businesses, and that famous natatorium. Then the Army Corps of Engineers, not understanding the movement of sand up and down the, the beach system, built that North Jetty, spent $800,000. Why didn't they build two? They couldn't afford more than one. And then uh, what happened was they cut off the sand supply that was there, uh, and everything started eroding and going into the ocean. By 1928, the erosion had caused it to go bankrupt. 1932, the natatorium was the, uh, deemed unsafe, and then in 36, the roof caved in. So may, an additional major erosion, 1939, 42, 48, and 52. And then in 52, uh, the, the spit was completely cut off from the mainland. It was an island. In 1952, they shut the uh, post office. It was closed, and Bay Ocean disappeared. Then in 69 through 71, the Army Corps of Engineers built a new jetty. And what happened? All the sand came back. Uh, and, and so, again, the Corps of Engineers did not understand those things. Now we do. So if you ever hear stories about Bay Ocean, it is the city that fell into the ocean. Also, along the coast, all of our sand dunes are growing at a huge rate. This is on the Hanlam Spit, some of my students, and they are 50, 60, 70 feet high. All of those spits only had um, dunes that maybe were 5 to 10 feet high. Why? Because we imported European beach grass, which the sand blows in and then it hits it and falls down. The beach grass just continues to grow up. And all of the dunes up and down the coast. Also, uh, what happens is the movement of the sand goes back and forth along the coast in between the headlands. And so here is Cape Mears and Cape Falcon. Uh, and the sand comes out of the rivers, onto the beaches, moves back and forth. And especially during El Nino years, all of it moves to the north and then and erodes all the beaches at the south. And then in normal years, then it moves back forth. And so we have something like 30 of these cells along the coast. You can see here is, um, uh, 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 this is Cape Falcon that is right here. And you can see one of the cells. So all of the sand coming down moves back and forth and back and forth. And in El Nino years, it becomes Hell Nino because what happens is, you get erosion of the beaches at the south end. This is just outside of Newport, but also uh, Neskowin is another place and Cape Mears. And it exposes a lot of tree forests. These are one of the two ghost forests that we have along the coast that are two to 4,000 years old um, and because the beach used to be way out here. And then it, what has happened through time, everything has eroded in. Uh, this is at Cove Beach. After the big El Nino we had in 1982, eight houses uh, were undercut because of the huge erosion that occurred at the southern end of the, the cell. Here's another landslide also at Cove Beach that was cut there. And the famous one that occurred in 1997, El Nino, uh, that was Cape Mir, uh, uh, the Cape's uh, housing de uh, condo development, which was at, down in Neetarts Bay. Uh, and in, in our club, um, Tom Hendrickson, who uh, recently passed away, was the um, chairman of the whole condo complex. And you can see what happened is the landslide in front of it eroded away at the toe and started moving, and all these condos were endangered at that time. Along the coast, we have a lot of high cliffs because the, uh, the ocean cuts into them, and that is the, because our co coastal area is uplifting all of the time and eroding away. And when uh, some of the rock that is found there gets uh, cut off from the rest of it, it forms a stack, sometimes a sea arch, sometimes a sea cave. Our most famous stack in Oregon is Haystack Rock, one of the five most photographed uh, places in the state of Oregon. It's basalt that came all the way uh, as a magma across the state in the ancestral Columbia River. Uh, and then the other Haystack Rock is down further south, uh, and this is at Cape Kiwanda. It also is a basalt one. And then these are all big sand dunes in here at Pacific City uh, along the way. Uh, and then down south in, in, um, in the Klamaths, you have huge rocks. A lot of them have actually uh, slid down in landslides off of the uplift of the Klamath Mountain. Uh, here is a CR, this is actually a heated 
Sa Santa Cruz, California, but Arch, Arch Rock, which is also down south, there is one here in Oregon. Also, I wanted to mention the huge sand sheets that we have here uh, in Oregon. Uh, and where did all that sand come from? It came from, because during the last glacial period, from 25,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, the ocean was uh, 300 feet lower. And so all the beaches were uh, many, many miles off of the coast. And then as sea level rose, all that sand was moved in and concentrated along the coast and then blew inland. And so along the coast, we have these from the Clatsop Plains all the way down to Florence and then also Bandon Dunes. All of that sand uh, uh, along the coast is, is, is part of that. At Cape, uh, Cape Kiwanda and Pacific City, we studied all of the, the sand dunes right there. And if you look at them, you'll see all these big black lines. We dated all of those. Uh, and the lowest one down here is 5,000 years old. You can see the uh, here is the, uh, the A horizon, which has a lot of charcoal in it, so we can use radiocarbon dating for that. Uh, and, and so all of that sand arrived there 5,000 years ago. That's when uh, a sea level rose to the point where it is today. And we put together the sea level rising up uh, with time in that area. Also wanted to point out one other thing and, uh, before I just end up talking about earthquakes, and that is along the coast, always look at the surf. And if you got kids, uh, do not, uh, if there are, is no surf out uh, from the beach, that means that what is happening is uh, the water is building up there and those are what we call currents. And if you get caught in it, to it, you can be shot right out into the ocean. So only swim in the ocean where there are surf zones out there showing you that there's a sandbar off of the coast. In Oregon, we have three different types of earthquakes. In the North American crust, 7.2 is the largest we can get. The Juan de Fuca plate, 7.3, but 9.0 is the subduction zone where one is where the Juan de Fuca plate and the Gorda plate are going underneath it. Um, and, and so the huge subduction zone quakes are 9.0. They last three to four minutes. And what will happen is the whole coast will drop up to six feet as the whole western part of the Oregon zooms towards uh, Japan. We tell people if you're at the coast and you're knocked off of your feet by, a la by an earthquake and it seems to last forever and ever, three and four minutes, because the bigger the magnitude, the longer the time, it, don't wait for the authorities to say, that was the big one, because it was. And you have 20 minutes to get to higher uh, ground, at least 50 feet, uh, because a tsunami may be on the way in. You're also going to get landslides, liquefaction, and shaking that is going to be occurring as a result of that. How do we put this together, to start this story together? By studying the ghost forests along the, the whole estuaries that are down there. If you want to find when those forests died, you just uh, radiocarbon date the wood found right underneath the uh, bark, and they all were about 300 years ago. Or you date the buried soil in the estuaries back in here, and that's the A horizon. That was, a, remember, at the surface, everything sunk. And those also were 300 years old. You dig down in there and you can find other buried soils down. And so we, the recurrence interval for these big earthquakes that we have along the coast, 300 years ago, 800, 1100. And the average is over the last 10,000 years, uh, 10,000 years. Uh, and, and so here's one of these examples, buried soil here. You'll notice the sand on top of it is missing. That was the tsunami that went over uh, the sand spit there and deposited sand on the area. And then this was all bay muds that were deposited in the uh, area. The last one was uh, uh, January 26th, the year 1700, put together uh, by uh, Kenji Sataki uh, and then also... Brian Atwater, there's Brian Atwater, put that story together. Uh, and then basically what has happened is Chris Goldfinger, who is r right there, a uh, professor down at Oregon State, has put together a story uh, that uh, uh, by studying uh, buried turbidites off of the coast in the last 10,000 years, 41 er landslide events, basically 19 of them, are, are found in every one of the six different holes. And so as a result, he says where the hole margin breaks, uh, uh, that is a 8.7 to 9.2, the big one earthquake occurring every 500 years. But the southern margin, it's about half of that, about 243 years. And so the hole margin breaking in the 
for ch chances in the future, 15% in the next 50 years, southern margin, 37%. Uh, and, and so it will create a tsunami. This is what we thought, used to think tsunamis look like, a series of huge waves. No, what happens is the ocean just, and you have just these uh, one huge 20 to 30 foot high one coming in, creating places like Tohoku, Japan, uh, like this. This is what the Oregon coast will look like after that. So we want you to get the higher elevation. Places like Seaside, they have to go across a couple of rivers in order to get the higher ground. Uh, and so along the coast, we have got uh, signs put in by Dogami, our state geological survey. You are entering the tsunami hazard zone. You're leaving. That is basically at 50 feet elevation. And if you're in one of those areas, you need to know where the evacuation route is. The good news is that on Ma March 11, everybody who has a cell phone is going to get Shake Alert uh, app that is going to be on there. It's part of the wireless emergency net network. Uh, and it, it, maybe some of you have had Amber Alerts before. Uh, somebody has been kidnapped and is going up and down uh, uh, I-5 uh, in a certain car. This was developed by the U.S. Geological Survey and universities, and it will tell you that a large earthquake has occurred, and you, it will tell you how long until the big energy, the S wave, arrives, uh, and it will tell you. You have five minutes, it is two minutes, or ten seconds. And if it's less than 10 seconds, duck, cover, and hold. But if it is Southern Oregon, which is three to four minutes away for the S waves, you have time to get out of the building, off of the out of elevators, and off of bridges. Uh, and, and so you can prepare for this. This is going to be a game changer for those. So I just leave you with uh, one thing. Uh, I love going to the beach. Uh, this is the... Um, um, uh, Sandcastle contest that is down at Cannon Beach every year. Uh, you always have to end with a beautiful sunset. This is somebody else's, a professional one along the coast. But here's mine, taking my family up at Crater Lake. Get out and see the coast and determine a great place to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, so much. Well, we have a couple of questions um, in the queue. We are going to start with Rotarian Dick Winger. Dick? I'm going to be quick because Kate Ertman, I think, has a question about what happens to road signs along the coast. But my question is, Scott, it seems um, it anti-intuitive that all that magna could have stayed fluid and hot enough to go 300 miles, but it must be, was that because it was so deep? Yeah, it comes from very, very deep in the earth. And when it comes out, it is very, very hot. Same thing that is occurring in uh, in Hawaii with all of those things. And that yeah, but it, traveling for miles traveling three hundred miles that's a long ways to stay hot and fluid, right? And it's, it's traveling very fast too. Okay, and it, it will crust over at the very, very top, uh, and then as it crusts over, it will insulate all, everything uh, beneath it. So, uh, and it's been shown to do this in Iceland even today. Good question. Thank you, Scott. Actually, due to time, our last question is already from President Ruth Shelley. So, Ruth. Got to unmute. Scott, I've asked you this before, but I was hoping that you could explain to the group how agates form on the beach because so many people enjoy going to the beach to find agates. And, and those are formed in those basalts that are found in the coast range. And there are going to be holes in those. And then as the bedrock that is found up on top weathers, all of that uh, quartz or, uh, is going to be coming down to the groundwater. It will precipitate on the inside of those holes. And uh, therefore, many agates show layer upon layer upon layer. Then they, because it's mostly quartz or jasper, which is a type of quartz, which is red, uh, they will weather out of the basalt. They'll get into the streams. Streams will carry them down to the coast, and then you'll find them along the coast. So thank you very much for your time uh, today, and it was fun filling in. Uh, and so I'll send it back to Ruth. Thank you, Scott. Gosh, you are a gift to our club. We are so grateful for you filling in at the last minute with such a great presentation. Next week. We'll hear from Jonathan Garcia, who will talk to us about Portland Public Schools. And once again, the meeting will be live via Zoom at noon on Tuesday. I wanna thank you for joining us, Kirsten, today and any other virtual guests who join us. Ken, thank you for your reflection about happiness. 
Kurt, we hope to get a lot of signups for March Madness. And thanks again to the whole team who helped us move to our new Rotary office. Scott, again, we are so grateful for you stepping in with another fascinating presentation. And I can never go to the beach without thinking of you and sand deposition. As we enter into a new Rotary week, please join me in opening the doors of opportunity for healing, for recovery, and peace building. As Rotarians, we're here to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and with justice for all. Have a great week, everyone, and this meeting is adjourned.